grace, mercy, and peace is yours from the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome. My name is Lori. Thank you for choosing to spend part of your weekend with us during this Easter season, the season of resurrection and hope. Today, let us thank God for rest and renewal, for words of peace and invitations to spiritual growth. May this new day be a time when we will give more thanks for life than we did yesterday. May God give us ears to hear his will for us, hands that are open to others, and eyes to see the beauty in this world. Our worship has already begun, so let's join together as we sing, pray, and listen for God's voice. Let us build a house where love can dwell and all can safely live. A place where saints and children tell how hearts learn to forgive. Built of hopes and dreams and visions, rock of faith and vault of grace. Here the love of Christ shall end divisions. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Welcome to worship here at Westminster in this Easter season. Let us continue to share in the mystery and the wonder of the Easter season. Let us allow our hearts to ponder and our minds to reflect. And let us celebrate the glory of God together. And as we continue in worship, let us join together in prayer. Almighty God, grant that today and every time we come before you united in worship and prayer, we may be vividly aware of your presence among us. May we sense your power and protection and be revived to know deeper within our hearts and minds and souls the wonder of your incredible grace and peace and love that's revealed through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name and in whose name we worship and pray. Amen. Amen. You may now stand for our opening songs of praise.
You may be seated. The one who calls us to repent hears us and trust that our creator knows us through and through. Let us open our hearts to the healing of God's forgiveness. Please pray with me. Good and gracious God, we are creators of dust, ignorant of your revelation, misunderstanding your life, death, and resurrection among us needing forgiveness. We repent of our failure to give as you have given to us. We beg your mercy for our fallen world. We seek your word that we may live with the faith of Jesus. Be our solace in this life and always. We ask this as your own children, holy and incomplete. Forgive us and lead us. Hear us now as we offer you our silent confession. Our God, who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, loves you as you are. In the name of Jesus Christ, and by his authority alone, 
I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of our sins. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. You may stand. On this day, the peace of Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Please turn to your neighbors and extend that same peace to those around you, and then you may be seated. Let us pray. Holy God, by your spirit, reveal your radical, surprising love. Come to us through your holy word, and let us hear what you are saying. Amen. This morning's Bible reading is from Ecclesiastes 12, chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come, and the years draw near when you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return with the rain and the day when the guards of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the women who grind cease working because they are few and those who look through the windows see dimly when the, doors are on, when the doors are on the street are shut and the sound of the grinding is low and one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of song are brought low when one is afraid of heights and terrors are in the road. The almond trees blossom, the grasshopper drags itself along and desire fails because all must go to their eternal home and the mourners will go about the streets before the silver cord is snapped and the gold bowl is broken and the pitcher is broken at the fountain and the wheel is broken at the cistern and the dust returns to the earth as it was and the breath returns to God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, says the teacher, all is vanity. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and our living of the Holy Scripture. Thank you, Lori. All right, good morning. Let's check in with the younger members of our church here. A couple over here. How are we doing? Lucy and Liam. Yes, the wards, younger members of our church, to be sure. You're not thumbs down. I can see your... I can, I can hear you giggling. Let's see, anybody up in the balcony? Thumbs to the side. I can understand that. Anybody, how are we doing over there? In the, how are we doing? Thumbs up? All right. Thumbs, in the, thumbs up in the back? All right. We gotta, we're undecided over here in the corner. I can hear. A little undecided. Well, it's good to hear. Good to see you. Good to see you today. You know, Lucy and Liam... You had celebrated a birthday in your family this week, right? Grandma had a birthday. It's exciting. I'm not going to talk about how many birthdays it is for Grandma. We're just going to celebrate a birthday. But, you know, birthdays are fun, aren't they? It's fun. Isn't it fun to have a birthday? When it's your birthday, what, what, what sometimes happens? You get birthday parties. Anybody have a birthday party? Raise your hand. Anybody? Any of up there? Any Pavones? Do you ever have a birthday party? No? Just 
living the boring life, no, no celebrations, no parties. Do you ever, have a, do you ever get a birthday cake? Or yet, do you ever get bir birthday pie? That's my favorite. Birthday, Michael, you get birthday cake? Fran, you make them? Do you make the birthday cake? And, and let's, let's see. If we have birthday cake, what do we do? What do we put on birthday cakes? What do we put on birthday cakes? <laughs> Candles, right? Tough crowd today. Jeez, man. If you never had a birthday before, I assume. Boy. And we, we, get, we put candles on it. How many candles do we put on our, our cake? A bunch. Yeah. The order you get, it just becomes one candle, right? But it, usually, how many do you put? Like if you're, if you're turning 10, usually you put 10 candles on, right? Or if you're 5, you put... Or sometimes people put one candle and have the number on it, right? That's a, it's a celebration. We, we're we're going to be talking... Uh, in our church about this next couple weeks about aging and celebrating those places in our life where we age and we get to grow up and we get to grow old and we get to do so here in the church and I was thinking you know what God doesn't have birthdays like we do we get to have cakes and we have candles and we get to celebrate someone's day and I was thinking about candles and I was thinking you know what God doesn't have birthday cakes with candles but you know what every Sunday we light these two candles, don't we? We light these two candles. And they're, they're not birthday cake candles, but you know what? When we see them, we can celebrate something. We get to, let's celebrate that God is with us here in the sanctuary. So when you see these candles, I want you to remind, see these candles and be reminded of candles on a birthday cake and how fun that is. And I want you to think of these candles and think, you know what? God is in this place, and this is a great and holy and awesome place to be when we gather together. All right, let's put our hands up, put our hands together, and let us pray together. Holy God, we thank you for birthdays and for growing up and for birthday cakes and for candles. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So beginning uh, today, over the next four weeks beyond today, we are going to be having a conversation about aging, about what it means to grow up and to grow old as a part of the faith community that we call the church. And uh, I had someone before earlier today when I came in, they said, are you going to say good things about old people? I said, we'll see if I have good things to share. But I thought I would uh, ease us into this conversation about aging uh, by sharing a few classic one-liners that maybe you've heard before from uh, some comedians of our day or of days gone by. This is from Rita Rudner. She said, I don't plan to grow old gracefully. I plan to have facelifts until my ears meet. <laughs> Andy Rooney. He once wrote, I've learned that life is like a roll of toilet paper. The closer it gets to the end, the faster it goes. Phyllis Diller, in her wisdom, said, Whatever you may look like, marry someone your own age, because as your beauty fades, so will their eyesight. <laughs> George Burns famously once said, When I was a boy, the Dead Sea was only sick. Bob Hope once said, middle age, well, that's when you still believe you'll feel better in the morning. <laughs> and then Woody Allen, we'll wrap up with this. He said, it's not that I'm afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> so aging, this is something that happens to all of us. It's this natural predictable process that begins the moment we're born. It accelerates over a few decades. It eventually becomes undeniable. And it is sort of the dominant factor in our minds in the last sort of third of our life. I mean, we know that aging is natural and it's predictable that we all have to go through this. There are, of course, moments in our lives where we don't think about it as much 
as we do in other moments in our lives. You know, in our youth, I mean, how few of us sit and when we're young thinking about what old age is going to look like or what we're going to experience when we get older or what the effects of aging is going to feel like. You know, we still, we tell our boys still, brush your teeth. You're going to want them when you're older. They're not thinking about that. <laughs> they're, not, they're thinking about tomorrow or what it's like to be young. They're not worried about those things. On the other hand, as you get older and your birthday starts to be filled up with candles and candles and more candles as uh, your body begins to show its age and tell you how old it feels, you start thinking a lot about aging and what it means for your life and, and how the world looks and how you experience it. And so I thought, you know, having been through a really serious season of Lent and uh, the wonderful celebration of Easter, I thought let's sort of maybe just change gears a bit Let's adjust our conversation and let's talk about what it means to grow up and to grow old in the life of the church. And I'm hoping that through this series we might maybe experience three things. That we might take the opportunity to, to uh, celebrate the fact that whatever age we are in, that God appears faithful in those moments of our lives. That there is good news to proclaim whether we're old or whether we're young or somewhere in between on that spectrum. Two, that we might be able to celebrate how the Christian faith enables us to live through both the joys and struggles that we experience in aging. And we may be able to celebrate what the church does for us so that we can experience confidence and hope in the midst of the ups and downs of life. And three, that we might be able to ask or be more intentional in asking ourselves the question, where is God leading me at this stage of my life? Or what is God calling me to do at this stage of my life? So we're ready to get started. Let's, let's pray. Holy and gracious God, may the words of my mouth, may the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you, because you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You know, I have to mention, you know, right in the midst of that prayer, how many heard a baby crying? How many heard a baby crying? There's a wonderful, beautiful story of... Uh, as the sermon was be getting ready to begin, uh, a baby started crying, and uh, the mom went to usher the baby out of the sanctuary, and the pastor was visiting, visiting from a developing country, and, and stopped and said, please do not leave. Where I live, our children are too malnourished to cry. So crying is a sign of life. Let us rejoice and give thanks in it. Let that be a segue into this conversation about growing up, about growing old in the church. Let us be a church for all ages. As we begin this sermon series, I thought, you know, what does the Bible say about aging? That's what I want us to look at today. What does it say about how we are to grow old gracefully? How we're to grow up in the church. And so I began to do some studying and, and research, and I thought, let's begin in the Old Testament, and then we'll get to the New Testament later in the, in the sermon. But I, I wanted to begin with the Old Testament. And you might be interested to know that there's really not a whole lot of material in the Old Testament that speaks ex explicitly on how we're supposed to grow old gracefully. There's not a lot of wisdom shared about this is what we're supposed to do. This is how we're supposed to live as we age. There are a couple passages that talk about um, the age of our years. One passage in Genesis 6 says that uh, God says that the oldest a person really should live is about 120 years. Psalm 90 verse 10 seems a bit more realistic when it says, quote, we live at best to be 70 years old, maybe 80 if we're strong. 
So if you're in your 90s, speak of the strength that you must have. Now there are lots of stories in the Old Testament um, that involve older characters. In a couple of weeks, we're going to uh, spend some time with two of those characters, Abraham and Sarah. Beyond the stories that simply just involve old characters, the writings of the Old Testament really show a lack of interest in talking about aging and what it means in terms of our relationship with God or the relationship with the people around us. And I was thinking, well, why do they sort of not have these conversations? And the reality is, is because the people of Israel and also the, the people of the early church they didn't place much stress on different ages and stages of life. And that's because aging and dying were simply just natural, expected processes that they believed were ordained and guided by God. And so if you believe that God's in control of the aging process, if God is in control of the giving and the taking of life, then why spend any time at all thinking about it or worrying about it? But still, there are passages that reflect some thoughtful conversation or some wonderings about well, what does it mean to be old? There are a few passages that recognize that old age can be a, a, a symbol of, of God's reward for a life well lived. In Proverbs 16.31, it says, quote, Gray hair is a crown of glory. Those with gray hair, you might argue that. But um, it says, Gray hair is a crown of glory. It is found on the path of righteousness. And of course, in the book of Exodus, with the Ten Commandments, we're told to show regard to the older members of our faith communities. Honor your father and your mother. And I think that's more expansive than that. I think there's an assumption that you honor all fathers and mothers, that you honor all those who are older than you. All of those with crowns of glory. Now, having said that, I, I came across this passage from Ecclesiastes 12, and I thought, well, let's spend a few moments today looking at this. This is an interesting text. Billy Graham once called this passage, quote, one of the most poetic and yet candid descriptions in all of literature on the subject of old age. Pastor and scholar William Willimon uh, less charitably describes this passage as, quote, beautiful, but brutal. You know, it begins beautifully. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Remember, this is a passage from a book that was written by uh, someone who was old, intended to be read by those who were young and youthful in their community of faith. And it begins sounding like good advice from the old to the young. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Essentially, you know, come to church, go to youth group, read the Bible, do what God expects of you. Do those things, you will grow up, you'll have a strong faith to hold on to. Great advice, but then it takes a quick turn and gets rather serious. It says, remember the Creator before the days of trouble come and the years draw near when you will say, I have no pleasure in those things anymore. I mean, it talks about old age as this day of trouble. It says to teenagers, Remember God when you're young. Because when you are old, life will get very difficult. And your relationship with God will be challenged. And then the passage doesn't stop there. And it, it uses a, a litany of metaphors to sort of 
shed light on what it feels like to be old. And again, remember, this is written to someone who's young, and they're saying, listen, when you get old, this is what you have to look forward to. Your hands will shake, your weak legs will get crooked, your teeth will fall out, your eyesight goes, you get lonely, you never get a good night's rest, your voice fades away, you become afraid of things, your hair turns white, you creak and stumble around, your desire for intimacy fades, and it ends with this cheery note, the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the breath returns to the God who gave it. That hit too close to home for any of you here this morning. See, I wanted to sort of use this text as we begin this series on aging because it includes an incredible amount of honest wisdom. For those who are younger, it doesn't sugarcoat the realities of aging. I mean, these words are written to essentially teenagers saying you had better think about your relationship with God when you are young and things are relatively easy because days are going to come as you get older when pain is going to set in and your relationship with God is going to be challenged. Those are gloomy but they're honest words. They're deeply insightful words that imply to the youth of our faith community that there is way more preparation required for the rigors of growing up and aging than simply accumulating a healthy bank account. Now let's transition to the New Testament a bit and continue this conversation about aging. You know, in, in comparing and contrasting the Old and New Testaments this week, I kind of realized something about the New Testament, that when we get to the New Testament, to the stories of the Gospels, the stories involving Jesus, the, the letters of the Apostle Paul to the church, that many of the characters really become younger than the characters we find in the Old Testament. Of course, that's not a, a blanket statement, but there is a bit of a theme that I saw. I mean, just think about the, the story of Jesus. It involves a young Mary who gets pregnant at a young age. We celebrate the, the birth of Jesus and uh, his childhood. Jesus' ministry began when he was 30, a relatively young age still to be sure. He recruits young men to be his first disciples. The Apostle Paul, it's likely that he really began and continued his ministry of planting churches around the age of 30. But let's not just believe that, that the early church was a young man and a young woman's game. In the in Gospel of Luke, we are introduced to some elders in the story. Think of Zechariah and Elizabeth who are old but yet give birth to John the Baptist who sort of is going to usher in for us the ministry of Jesus Christ. It is through these two elders in the faith community that they sort of are inspired instruments to lead us to Jesus. We also can't forget in the Gospel of Luke the, the characters Simeon and Anna. They are these old people in the faith community who, who greet the newborn Jesus with excitement when he is brought into the temple with his parents. I think that's still today. I mean, when you have a baby come into a, into a community, the old people get so excited to see the child present. And Simeon and Anna, they carry within them in this story sort of the hope for deliverance that their community has. They are sort of the hope carriers for the next generations. 
Zechariah and Elizabeth and Simeon and Anna, they serve as sort of signposts of hope for the future younger generations. And these characters are celebrated in the Gospels. They're celebrated because they are not just simply these old people who are stuck in the past, who are unwilling to change. No, these people are celebrated for their radical openness to the future, for their willingness to be dreamers for their faith community. One more stop in the New Testament. In the pastoral epistles of 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, we, we show how the early church gave respect and honor to older members in their faith community. In 1st Timothy chapter 5, it says, Don't speak harshly to older men, but speak to him as to a father. The same letter talks about the importance of, of providing community assistance for widows. And while the church is to show respect and honor to the older people in the community, There is an expectation that the older people in the community have a responsibility to be good role models for the younger people in the community. We see this in Titus chapter 2. We also see it again in 1 Timothy chapter 5 where the older members of the community are, are called to be devoted to prayer, to acts of hospitality, to acts of service for those who are in need. And so we've just taken a brief survey through the Old Testament and the New Testament to just begin thinking about aging in the community of faith. But I want to close with with something that I noticed. It's very important. As I worked my way through these passages and, and thinking about aging in the Bible, there's something that the Bible never says when it comes to aging. See, nowhere in the Bible are the elderly supposed to be pitied or patronized or ever treated with condescension. Nowhere is aging ever described as a problem to be solved or cured or fixed. Nowhere are the oldest in the community described as pitiable or irrelevant or behind the curve, or as inactive or unproductive. For the theme that does exist throughout Scripture is that no matter what your age is, old or young, if there is breath in your lungs, God is calling you to service. God is calling you to glorify and enjoy Him forever. God is calling you to love your neighbors. God is calling you to use your gifts that you have been given. And those gifts, when they are given to you, don't have an expiration date, like retirement. God is calling all of us into service. So may we spend some quality time these next few weeks, talking about our faith through the lens of our age, whatever that age may be. May we listen to the stories of aging found in various passages of Scripture in both the Old and New Testaments, and may we find somewhere our own story being told. And may we demonstrate in our life together the difference that Jesus makes and can make in the way that we grow up and in the ways that we grow old together as a community of faith. Amen. And now in response to God's gifts of grace and love, let us give the offerings of our life and labor this day.
There we go. Friends, let us bring all of our joys and concerns now to God in prayer. Holy God, we pray to you this day, praying for your holy church, that it may be filled with love and grace, and may be found without fault at the day of your coming. Holy God, we pray to you for the leaders of the church. for all ministers and elders and deacons, for the staff of this church, for committee chairs and volunteers, for all the holy people of God. We pray to you, God, for all who Believe in your Son, Jesus Christ. May we be one as you are one with Christ. (coughs) God, we pray for the mission of the church, that in faithful witness we may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. God, we pray for those who do not yet believe and those who have lost their faith, that they may receive the light of the gospel. God, we pray for the peace of the world, that a spirit of respect and forbearance may grow among nations and peoples. God, we pray for those in positions of public trust and service, that they may serve justly and promote the dignity and freedom and safety of every person. God, we pray for all who live and work in this community. God, we pray for a blessing upon all human labor and for the right use of the riches of creation that the world may be freed from poverty, famine, and disaster. God, we pray for the poor, the persecuted, and all who suffer, for refugees, prisoners, and all who are in danger, that they may be relieved and protected. God, we pray for this congregation that we may be delivered from hardness of heart and show forth your glory in all that we do. God, we pray for our enemies and those who wish us harm even as we pray for all whom we have injured or offended. God, we humbly pray for ourselves, for the forgiveness of our sins and for the grace of the Holy Spirit to amend our lives. We pray for our families, friends, and neighbors that being freed from anxiety, they may live in joy peace, and health. God, we also pray for all who have died in the communion of your church, that strengthened by their witness, we may be grateful for their example, living in justice and love until we join them in life eternal. For rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, we entrust ourselves and one another and all of life to you, O Lord our God. For we pray these and all things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may now stand as we join together in our closing song of praise. Are you going to take a hike? When? Where? Uh, Mill Creek Park, Lanterman's Gorge, Saturday, April 24th at 1 p.m. All the way around? That's a good hike. I love the Silver Bridge. Will we cross it? Yes, and we're going to go up the other side. It's a wonderful hike. Frank, are you going? I am. I'm in charge of the refreshments at the end, like tailgating, club, water and chips, and conversation. Do I have to sign up? Bring the boys, Adam. Can I come? <laughs> Am I allowed? You are. But All right. You, you got to bring the boys, you understand. All right. This, this is for families. Bring the kids, even the little ones, four or five years old, can make the walk easily. It's the old folks that need to help with the refreshments. <laughs> I can't wait. Is it rain or shine? Yeah, but make sure that you dress for the weather. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. You skipped me. What? You skipped me. <laughs> yeah, man, uh, they're going to go fight about who messed up where. and then uh, The walk will be smoother than that exchange <laughs> on Saturday. As I close... Um, uh, our service at this time. Uh, I'm going to end our services with um, uh, some pieces of advice. Uh, this past week I reached out to, on, on social media, uh, a group of Christians who were all older than the age of 40, and I asked them this question. Looking back, what piece of advice do you wish your younger self would have known growing up that would have made your journey to adulthood a bit easier? And I got a 50 or 60 responses, which I can't share them all. So I'll pull out the highlights. Here, here I'm going to give three each Sunday. Here's one.
to the younger people of our church. You can't be anything you want to be. <laughs> Let that soak in. You can attain skills in a particular field and push yourself, but there are some things you just won't be able to do, and that's okay. Everyone has different gifts and callings. Number two, don't be afraid to push things a little bit. Be adventurous. And number three, you are going to strive and fail over and over again. Don't be ashamed of failing. Learn from it and always show grace to yourself and others. Friends, let us pray. Holy God, we thank you that throughout our journey of life, you appear faithful and present in our lives, regardless of our age. May we celebrate that truth this day as we do our best to grow up and to grow old as a community of faith. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you, those whom you love, and those who think no one loves them. Amen. Amen.